And joining us now is the former Premier of Saskatchewan, Roy Romano, now Chair of the Institute of Wellbeing on the Advisory Board. It's good to have you here at TVO again. Steve, thanks very much for having me, Evan. I'm enjoying being back. I want to pursue this issue of the index of well-being with you as right. a new means of measuring sort of the quality of our life here in Canada. We've got lots of ways of measuring how well we're living in this country, but you think this is better. What makes this better? I think what makes it better are a number of factors, but I would sing about the following. I think that the predominant factor or the predominant indicator that Canadians watch is something called the GDP. Uh, it has become kind of a surrogate for everything that we do. So if the GDP is up, we think that things are better. If it's down, we think it's worse. But as the inventor of the GDP himself, a guy called Kuznets said, he said it's just a measurement of goods and services produced, and it's very incomplete. There needs to be other tools involved in this. But nonetheless, it's become almost, almost iconic. It is the surrogate for how our society performs. So the theory behind the Institute is what we need to do is to put uh, on the opposite end of the teeter-totter, if I may use that metaphor, something like the Canadian Index of Well-Being, which would measure things which the GDP does not. We're not opposed to the GDP. It's an important economic tool, but we put into the other end of the teeter-totter uh, elements related to healthy living and education. And the idea being, to wrap this all up, that the policymakers and decision makers would have a better uh, overview, a better handle of how to form the appropriate policies. Well, I like the example you give of the car accident, which, if you measure it by GDP, does create a lot of goods and a lot of services, right? Go through that example, if you would. Well, exactly. Uh, the, uh, the car, uh, the one that I'd like to have changed even the car example, the other example is if you have an ice storm in Quebec right. or in, in Ontario, the GDP goes up. Uh, Hurricane Katrina in the United States, the GDP went up. You have more jails, more prison guards, the GDP goes up. Mm -hmm. But uh, what does this tell us about the quality of life and what does it tell us about uh, how our life can be reoriented? That's not to say we don't need jails, of course, or that these natural catastrophes don't happen. Mm -hmm. But if it is strictly a measurement of the goods and services produced, full stop, period, I think it d uh, negates the intrinsic worth, inherent worth of individuals. It's not necessarily an indication of, of how well we're doing. And to that That's end, right. you have a scale here of eight different things that you measure. And I want to put this up and share this with our viewers right now. Here's the wellness index that you think is a preferable way to measure how well we're doing. Right. Number one, measure living standards. Number two, healthy populations. Number three, community vitality. Number four, the environment. Number five, education. Number six, time use. Seven, civic engagement. And eight, arts, culture, and recreation. Right. Now you see this Canadian index of well-being, as you're calling it, as all eight areas being somehow interconnected. How so? Yeah. Well, uh, they are interconnected. Let me say, first of all, Steve, I'll answer your question or try to answer it in a moment. These eight categories really were culled as a result of the literature which is around, and also something which I think is rather interesting and novel. Uh, we did three cross-Canada consultations with interest groups about what they thought would be the components of a CIW or an index, and thus the eight that uh, you have put on the monitor. Uh, what we've done is release uh, three of them, and these three are the top three that you've mentioned. So they're interconnected. Let me give you one example. The first one is living standards. That talks about income. What do we see? We see as a conclusion of all the data that is before us, and by the way, the data comes from Stats Canada. It's not Roy Romano making it up or somebody else making it up. Uh, living standards are up. Generally, our incomes are up. That's the good news, except if you plumb down deeper, what happens is the top 20% of the earners in Canada, they have received the lion's share of the benefits of that increase. The remaining 80% have actually seen their incomes drop. In the consequence of that, two or three things have happened. First of all, the uh, poverty rate remains the same. In 1981, the gap was something like $6,500, $6,700 a year difference. It remains the same in 2007. The safety net is frayed, more pressure, and the social problems are attached. And here's my last point, sorry to be long-winded. What's important about that is that we're in a recession, Steve, to state the obvious. We know, historically, factually, that when we come out of this recession, those gaps, that disparity, will continue. It'll be actually exacerbated. Now, where does the connection come? Well, the next connection is the health um, indicators. You've anticipated and my next question. Exactly. What are you and, uh, measuring and, there? And, and, yes, and just to, sorry to be long-winded about this, there is clear evidence that health outcomes are directly related to income and education. The better the income, the better the education, generally the better the health outcomes are.
there's the interconnectedness. And then you can attach it to the other uh, side of it as well, which is the nature of the communities that we live in. That's our third standard that we've released on. Before you get there, I want yeah. to do a follow-up on health, because we have life expectancy rates that are among the highest in the world. Right. And your index of well-being says, however, that there is a more complex or a more mixed picture that actually emerges from some of these. What's the, what's the more mixed picture of the sort of life expectancy state of our health in this country, that kind of thing? Well, uh, yes, first of all, that is true. Uh, if you take the average of men and women's life expectancy, we're looking at 80 years, some, 80.4 uh, years of life, uh, <coughs> which is very good. That's a testament to the, to the Canadian situation. But like any indicator, especially in a rich tapestry of a large country like ours, the small population, it's uneven. Uh, here are the consequences, which really are troublesome. Uh, 44 and under, the age of uh, Aboriginal people, 44 years of age and under, represent the highest rate of suicides and uh, injury deaths uh, of any segment in society. If you take a look at what's going on in Nunavut, Northwest Territories, and in the Yukon, or in Aboriginal centers and communities, I can speak about it in Western Canada, again, the pop health outcomes and their living and life expectations are dramatically lower. So it is an uneven picture. The average is as it is, but the equality, the disparities are very important. And what happens is, of course, life of suffering, whether it's diabetes because there's obesity. And there's one other dimension about the health issue which is troublesome as well, and that is that we're finding that amongst teenagers, now this is a self-rated assessment. Teenagers are asked, you know, how do you feel about your health? The indication for the first time is they, they don't feel good about their health, and quite frankly, I don't know why. I've got something on this. Let's follow up on this. Michael, this board in the middle of um, Chapter 3 here. The living longer, Canadians' rating of their health status has declined. The proportion of Canadians who consider themselves as having very good or excellent health peaked in 1998 at 65.2% and decreased dramatically in 2003 to 58.4%. This decline runs across the population but is most marked among teenagers. Now, what I found interesting here is that this means that people feel less healthy, not that they necessarily are right. less healthy. So how meaningful a measurement is this, really? Now, that's a very tough question to answer. Uh, all I can tell you is what the experts say. I'm not an expert in this area, but the stats people say that self-rating, self-evaluation, when it can, is tied up to other correlations and other uh, standards of measurement to determine how accurate the, 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 the self-evaluation is, that it's proven to be a very, very accurate figure. Very often, if you don't feel well, uh, something's wrong with you. Usually in the case of teenagers, it may not be physical health, it may be emotional health. Well, you might have just broken up with your girlfriend or boyfriend. That's exactly. I mean, I, I felt that many times when I was a teenager. <laughs> so it, it, who knows? But what, what it does indicate, and I must say that this is something that I think needs to be really examined in more detail, if that self-evaluation is correct, and if the outside correlative factors prove to be correct, I'd like to know why that is the case, uh, whether it's something in our society, whether it's something we watch on television, or what is it that, that produces this? Is it the new internet age, where there's no direct personal connectivity, but the indirect connectivity? I don't know, but I find that a very interesting uh, uh, fact, and it jumped out at you and it jumped out at me, and I've been asking the advisors, what do I say when Steve Pakin asks me this? Yes, I'm I don't sure you did. I have. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is. I don't think they do, they, they do either. But that's what I think is the importance about the index of well-being. Let's pursue it. Okay, pursue number three here. Third and final domain that you've got out in this report just out, community vitality. What right. are you looking for there? Well, you see, we all live in communities, and I think that, uh, to say the obvious, how, how healthy the community is is very important. When I say healthy communities, I mean um, level of uh, volunteer work. Uh, commitment to charity, uh, how about the level of uh, support uh, to families who are ill, unpaid uh, assistance to family members who are ill, uh, what do we do with respect to, to uh, charity contributions, I think I may have mentioned that. Here we are in pretty good shape as Canadians. The statistics show that consistently we're the same if not better throughout the piece. This indicates that there's a community that cares for each other and it does the best that it can, but it does it on a volunteer basis. I'm not against volunteer. I'm not against people who do this out of love and affection. That's an important part of what I think we are as human beings and Canadians. <coughs> but very often in some of these circumstances, if you're an unpaid caregiver and the person who is ill requires actually a paid caregiver, we don't have a system in place. If we have a home care program which requires, quote, the unpaid caregiver, it's a little bit different. 
than having a home care program where there is somebody who is available to us when we don't have the money to look after a very critically ill person. So um, it's, it shows vitality, but it also shows the necessity for further work. I'm not doing too well on the well-being index myself right now. I've got this cough that I've had for a week and a half, so thank you for indulging me here. Let me read one more excerpt from the report. It goes like this. In 2003, compared to 1996, the number of Canadians reporting six or more close relatives dropped from 37 versus 34 percent, and the number reporting six or more close friends dropped from 40 percent to 30 percent. Now, I don't know if this is anything that anybody can do anything about, but how concerned should we be about that trend? I'm concerned about it. Uh, and again, it's like the question on teenagers. I, I don't know what this is all about to begin with, which is a terrible thing to say. I do know the numbers are there. When we continue to study it in further reports, we'll try to find some answers. Uh, the only thing that I can say, Steve, and it's pure speculation and maybe a reflection of my age and stage in life, uh, I, I find it interesting when we talk about Internet. I know it's today's world. By the way, go on CIW, Canadian Index of Wellbeing, .ca. People, quote, chat, end quote. Do they? When they get on all of these, they get these uh, chat rooms, they have information, they Twitter, whatever. They, I think this indicates kind of a remoteness. Uh, so we don't have this face-to-face -face dialogue that you and I are having, a discussion or a debate. They think of it as kind of multiple tasking. Uh, Maybe it's multiple tasking, but yeah. for sure it's remote. Mm -hmm. And it may very well be reflected in those kinds of responses. But that mm -hmm. is pure speculation. Um, I, I think we need to check into it further because we may very well have a um, detached <laughs> uh, future population on our hands, which I think will have knockoff effects, therefore, on the very other things we raised earlier about caring, being sure. supportive of the community and the like. As you look at all of the different categories that you're measuring now for this new well-being yeah. index, what's the best predictor of a strong quality of life? For the moment, I think it's clear income. Still got to make money. You're still got to make money. This is an old study which has never been refuted. Actually, it's been supported over and over and over again. Uh, it is, uh, there are related factors to this. Making money and, you're, and doing it in a job that you're not satisfied in doing, uh, that's a problem. I mean, you make the money, but you're unhappy going to work. But you have to have money, essentially because this provides better food, uh, nutrition, better housing, better education, a variety of these things which are not available to many, many Canadians, unfortunately. That's why I say the connectivity back to the first indicator, that we're richer overall, but the disparities are growing, but even is a the, big danger sign. I, I hear you, but it, 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 the rich always get richer, right? We never have to worry about them. But yeah. is, is it not the case that even the, not necessarily the poorest of the poor, certainly not, but, but even middle class people saw their incomes rise as well, certainly not as much as the rich, but, but the tide was lifting all boats to oh, a certain extent? No, there's no doubt about that. You're dead right. The, the, the numbers show that. Mm -hmm. but, but if you look at whether or not the tide rose, caused the boats to rise at the same levels well, they proportionately, we, they didn't. Right. So the should lower we tide. That? Yeah, we should, because the disparity increases. And when it increases, so too, the natural conclusion will be the health outcomes eventually okay. down the road. Okay. But the. the this is not me observing this. This yeah. is me playing devil's advocate no, and putting sure. it to you. We know income's important. We know, obviously, healthy populations right. are important. We know we need vibrant communities in order to feel better about life and so on. Is there anything particularly novel about this well-being index that you're putting forward right now? Well, at this stage in the game, what's novel is the fact that we're putting it out. Uh, so far as I know, there is no other agency in Canada or a body, and by the way, this is a citizens group. I'll add a <laughs> word about this in a moment, Steve that's putting it out. And when we do get the complete eight categories and are able to, this is our hope, to have a, a composite index number, like the GDP is up 2% or minus 2%, so it would be with CIW up 1% or whatever. So we have uh, an easily understandable operation. This matters. I mean, John Kenneth Galbraith said it very, very bluntly. He said, if you don't count it, it doesn't count. Hmm. Now. The thing that I wanted to say about the CIW, which I think is also important, is what the OECD, I can't speak for them, but they've told me this, tell us about us. I was invited to Istanbul two years ago. Great pleasure of mine. I addressed the plenary session of the OECD, which was a great honor. And I said, why, can't, why were we? And they were interested in the fact that this was not a government function that was being undertaken here. It was a collection of concerned organizations, family foundations, the Atkinson Charitable Foundation, uh, the Lawson family, McConnell, I can name them. RBC, actually, the bank is involved there as well. 
a citizen's operation. <coughs> and they viewed this as something which was interesting because in many of the OECD initiatives, they're a country, uh, not as nation motivated. This is people motivated. I think this speaks something to Canadian uh, strength and, and determination. So uh, what's novel about it? The community input. What's novel about it is that we're now developing something which uh, is a tool. We're counting it, so it should count. So and it will be a method of, uh, of um, how should I describe it? I don't want to sound too corny about this, but education and putting pressure on governments to act. Well, that's it. Is it your hope that someday, just finally, that you, you know, anybody could turn on the radio and as, as they're always on these business programs, Absolutely. reporting the GDP of the country today, yeah. you'll report the index for well-being as well. That's right. And, and people will say with credibility. If there's a problem, where is the problem? If a, the teenage problem, for example, grows into a larger one as they move out of teenage and into early adulthood or whatever, and, and there may be some knockoff effects that we'll see, this is what a society should be dealing about. Now, I want to make it absolutely clear. I don't look at all incomes being equal or everybody. And no, there's got to be reward for special jobs and special incentives and special skills that people have. That is what our society is about. But we can't allow that to go unattended where the disparities are so great and our society says we don't care about it. Because in my judgment, Steve, the value system and structure of this country is one which is based on caring for other people. Uh, maybe that's my old political bias. I don't believe it. I think that's an ethic of Canada. We care. If we stop caring, we'll be like other countries who shall go unnamed uh, nearby, which uh, I think will be detrimental to the, to the body politic and most importantly detrimental to this great country called Canada. So to me, this is a very exciting initiative. And we thank you for coming in and telling us about it. And I thank you for allowing me to uh, try to answer your tough questions. <laughs> Thanks very much, Steve. Very Roy Robinow, former Premier of Saskatchewan. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Steve.